We all want to feed our families well, but we need to stay within our budgets. Today, we're having a fun and illuminating chat with Dr. Carrie Behrens, who will help us to build simple habits for great nutrition on a budget. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Miladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Lisa Miladnik, your host, and our guest today is Dr. Carrie Behrens, helping us build simple habits for great nutrition on a budget. Dr. Carrie Behrens has worked in the health and wellness field for over 30 years. She has extensive education and experience in physical education, wellness, nutrition, and teaching individuals with disabilities. Dr. Behrens holds two master's degrees, adapted uh, physical education and teaching, and a PhD in kinesiology. She currently teaches exercise physiology physiology, sorry, I need help for my mouth today, and nutrition at the university level, and was previously a physical education consultant for deaf preschoolers and K-12 through students in Texas. To enhance her personal proficiency in sign language and nutrition, she traveled twice to to the Jamaica Deaf Village for mission work, and recently obtained her certification as a fitness nutrition coach and sports nutrition specialist. Dr. Behrens is passionate about education, home educated her three children for over 18 years, and has worked in online higher education since 2008. Dr. Behrens lives with her husband and her children in Michigan, and you can reach her at Dr. Dr. Underscore Barons, B E R E N D S, at MSN.com. And that's in the show notes. Also, uh, we'll have links to her courses at Homeschool Connections in fitness, nutrition, and American Sign Language. So you'll have no trouble finding Dr. Barons. Uh, just a wonderful resource in so many ways. So, welcome to the program, Dr. Barons. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, yeah, it's just great. Good to have you again. And, and I would refer everyone to, and this will also be in the show notes, to your previous episode, Why Physical Education is Important, Even If You and Your Kids Are Not Athletic. That was a great episode. We had so much fun. And that's, again, that's episode 51 for those of you who enjoy this chat and, and just really can't get enough of Dr. Behrens like we can't. Um, but just love to, to start us off, Dr. Behrens, by just saying that we're kind of heading into the new year. Our thoughts are turning to improving our habits, and we'd really love to be eating healthier, but we need to be saving money too. So what are some yes. basics to consider when we're planning our food choices? Well, so let's let's kind of back up just a little bit and, and talk about what constitutes a healthy diet. And so we use this word healthy diet, but by diet, um, I mean by a food plan, not by calorie cutting. And the healthy food plans are built of really four basic tenants. And I like to teach and review those um, so that people can constantly kind of do a self check with themselves and with them, their families for what, if they're having um, a healthy diet as part of their lives. So those four things are variety. Um, and that means basically, are we eating a multitude of different foods? And the reason we want variety is because we get a lot of our micronutrients, that's our vitamins and our minerals from the food we eat. And the larger variety of foods we eat, we're more likely to get all of our required vitamins and minerals. The second aspect of a healthy diet is adequacy. Do we have enough? Um, and you know, many of us are very blessed to have enough food, um, but there are those who don't, and it's a struggle, um, especially on a budget, to have enough. So a healthy diet has a variety, it has adequacy, and it also has moderation. So sometimes um, we take in too much food or we take in too much of one particular food, and that means um, we're not practicing moderation. So in order to have a high functioning body, we need to practice moderation for those things that could be harmful to us in larger amounts. And then finally, balance. Um, are we really balancing the amount of carbohydrates and proteins and um, fats in our diet? We need all three, uh, but we don't want to have an imbalance of those. So variety, adequacy, moderation, balance, you know, those are the things that really make up a healthy diet. 
And so I think that would be the first thing that we should do is we should take a step back and look at the foods that we're preparing, that we're purchasing, that we're eating, and see if it fits those categories of healthy food choices. Yeah, I was just thinking, how could we make this into an acronym or something so I never forget it? And it's VAMB, like lamb, Vamb. but with a V, VAMB. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> that might help me. Sure. Um, but what resources might lead us to those pillars that help us to maybe visualize it or, or capture it in a, in a way that we can share with our families? Yeah, well, um, you know, growing up in the United States, we've had often uh, visuals that were provided us to us by the government, such as the food pyramid. That's what we had when I was younger. And that has transitioned to what's called my plate. Well, I like to teach there's a, there's a better alternative to my plate. And um, I recommend the Harvard healthy eating plate. And so the Harvard eating plate has a lot more specific instruction and details. And I would even recommend um, taking a screenshot or a printout or something of this, um, and we'll put the um, the reference for you, I think, in the show notes, correct? Absolutely. Um, for the healthy eating plate. And I would even print that out and put it on the refrigerator or use it as part of your lesson with your children in um, what that involves. And the, he the healthy eating plate has um, suggestions for the right kinds of vegetables, uh, what types of fruits that we want, um, how much whole grains and healthy proteins. It mentions staying active and eating healthy fats and um, drinking water and adequate amounts and what types of beverages are good. So it's kind of like my plate, um, but, but much more informative and detailed. It has visual and um, it has it details, instructions for each of the aspects. So I would definitely say start with that with the family and make it a family thing to learn about what balanced, healthy eating looks like at every meal. Mm, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. It's nice to know that 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 information and those recommendations are being periodically updated and that there is a resource there for us that's that's up to date, that someone like you doctor who have so much experience and insight on like we could take a we could do a 10 hour series on this easily with you. I know because I've had some fun <laughs> conversations with you. But for those of us who are kind of newbies and just stepping in, where do we begin to make our healthy eating and our budget start to work together? Well, you know, as you know, everything starts with a plan. They say, you know, uh, what, what is the saying? Um, plan, fail to plan, plan to fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you do need to plan. You need to um, sit down. And for me, it's a Saturday or Sunday because it's usually when I get a break and a chance to sit down. And I like to plan everything out. Um, first of all, I think about what does the week look like for the family, um, for myself, um, not only as far as daily activities that we're going to be doing, but our schedules. Uh, what dinners will we, we, we be eating together? Will there be a time we will be on the go or out of the house? So we need to prepare ahead of time. So I not only look at planning the meal plan, because I know a lot of us meal plan, but looking at the logistics around that, where are we going to be and how are we going to get this to fit into our schedules? Because if we make bad choices with eating, many times it's tied to being on the go or having to grab something quickly so we don't get an opportunity to put much thought in it. So um, ch think about uh, whether or not you're going to be home, whether how many people are going to be for the meal. Um, good job at meal planning can also help us get out of a rut. I don't know about you, but sometimes my family says, you know, I'm kind of tired of spaghettis and tacos and the same, and they want to try something different. So by sitting down on a Saturday or Sunday, we can maybe browse through um, some cookbooks that we have. One of my favorite websites is allrecipes.com because there are a lot of reviews. So you can read what people thought about the recipe. Um, but planning, I would say, is the number one thing that you need to do um, yeah. in order to better your nutrition. Yeah. And that, that speaks to my heart because I'm not a great planner and it really shows. <laughs> and, um, but a friend of mine shared with me, and I'll have to look it up and, and get it into the show notes. Maybe, you know, Dr. Barron's, there's also a website where you can put in what you have on hand and it will come up with suggested menus, like ways to throw together what you have on hand. I'm going to ask my friend and I'll stick it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, the, the what you have on hand link. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so part of that plan is taking an inventory of what you do have in the house. Um, I know before I actually do my shopping or plan my meals, sometimes what I'll do is I'll open up the freezer doors and the refrigerator doors and I'll say, okay, what do we have in here that we should eat already? Because we know things get freezer burned, 
uh, they expire. They're not very good after they've been in to the refrigerator for a while. In my household, the freezer door opens and closes multiple times a day. So we get frost on some of our food. And so we can really enjoy using the foods that we already have without having to waste them or throw them away by um, maybe pulling those things out, laying them out on the table and saying, all right, what could we do with the food that we have first before we go spend money on food that uh, we need to go purchase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's so good. Just to like take a breath to reflect, to look at what's there, do a little brainstorming based on what you've already spent money on. Absolutely. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like the stuff in the bottom or the back of my fridge uh, I'm, or my freezer, I'm thinking in particular, it just gets forgotten. And we really have to rotate it forward. <laughs> Take a yes, look at it. <laughs> that's part of the planning as well. Absolutely. And I love that tip is to, uh, to go through, um, look at the containers, open them up, look, you know, and I would definitely not recommend just going on how they look or smell. Um, my biggest tip that I can say is one, the storage containers that I use, and I use ones that, um, they are clear on the top so you can see through, but I write with a Sharpie what's inside and the date that I put it in the refrigerator. And then I use a magic eraser to, to take off that um, Sharpie and, and I can write on it over and over again. Mm. So that's a trick I like to use that's as a so magic smart. eraser. Um, I used to use some masking tape, but then it would end up in the dishwasher and it would be stuck forever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh. But yes, taking an inventory of those foods, making sure for food safety that you throw away the food that's not good. And hopefully that's not um, too much. Um, I, I cringe anytime I throw any food away, especially if it's good, healthy food like vegetables that have gone bad. Um, but another thing that I do as part of my planning is because I don't know about you, but my, my kids constantly say, uh, what's for dinner? I'll get a text at 4.30, 5 o'clock every day, mom, what's for dinner? And sometimes a text even comes from a bedroom upstairs. Um, <laughs> and so I like to write, I have a chalkboard and I write out a plan for what's for dinner. So if it's Tuesday tacos or Wednesday pot roast or Thursday um, mix and match salads or fajita bowls, I write it out there. And then after repeatedly telling them, check the board, check the board. Eventually you don't have to tell them anymore and they'll just go look at the board and see what's for dinner. Another thing that I do, which also helps communication with the family as well as planning is I have a sticky whiteboard sheet. It's like a piece of paper, but it's a whiteboard sheet. And I stuck it to the front of my refrigerator. And I have actually two sheets. One of them is just an inventory of the foods that we have. And I use that not only as ideas for the uh, for my meal planning and for the snacks for the kids, um, but I also have another sheet where I have suggested healthy snacks. So I have one that says granola bars, apples with peanut butter, carrots and dressing, whole grain crackers with sliced cheese. And those are all my suggestions. So when my kids say there's nothing good to eat in the house, and we all have heard that many, many times, <laughs> yes, right? There's often. nothing good to eat. And there's, that's the worst thing we want to hear after we just spent $150 at the grocery store and made delicious, healthy meals and snacks. And then they open the fridge and say, there's nothing good to eat. So um, I use both the talk board for meals and then the whiteboard for individual um, items. And as I use those, or let's say that we ran out of apples, I don't erase them. I actually just draw a line through them because I want to know that we're out of it and I want to add it to my list. And then so when I come back and I've revamped and I've stocked back up on apples, I can just erase it with my finger and write apples again because we have them. So um, I do suggest using those whiteboard sheets for shopping lists, but also so that the, the kids have a and husbands have <laughs> a, a, a good idea of what's available in the house right now to grab that's a healthy snack or a healthy meal choice. Yeah, there's two things coming to me as someone who's really challenged with organization, but I'm very visual. If I have things in front of me or laid out in a visual way, I can I can relate to that. And I feel like so two things are happening. One is you're offering us a system that I feel like anybody can use. This is really simple and straightforward. It's sure. very intuitive. But the other thing is you're also teaching by example. Your children and your husband and anybody else who spends significant time in your house is is absorbing a systematic way of doing something. And that is so valuable. Yeah, I can remember the first time my daughter had a, an English muffin and she had a whole grain English muffin with peanut butter. And um, it's because she saw it suggested and she never considered having that. And she did. And so one day I was out of the house. She actually took a photograph 
and sent it to me. And she said, look at the snack that I'm having. She was very proud that she had chosen to have, once again, a whole grain English muffin with peanut butter. And, and I, of course, gave her very positive feedback and said, oh, great choice. I'm so glad you remembered that was a healthy snack you know, after your schoolwork's done. Mm-hmm. So they are learning, I think. Um, and, and it also helps us to, to have a variety of choices. And we don't just eat the same thing. And remember, variety is what was one of the things for a healthy diet. And we don't want to eat the same snacks again and again and again, because then we limit the amount of nutrients that we have. Mm, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and it's just more fun. Some of us need more variety than others. Some family members will want to eat the same things more often or have the same breakfast every day. But it really is better for our health. What about on the days when our plan blows up and we're now we're on the run and we thought we were having a family dinner or something like that? Sure, absolutely. So um, we there are certain foods that we know we need to prepare ahead of time and other other ones we don't. So I would like you to consider when you're planning throughout the meal or throughout the week, what are some things that are grab and go? So there are some fruits that have skins on them like apples and oranges and bananas. Um, those things are very easy to grab and toss and throw into a bag. You can't necessarily take um, celery sticks and, and eat them unprepared. Or if you have carrots, unless you have the baby carrots, um, you haven't peeled them and cut them up. Um, and you haven't taken a container. You can't throw a whole bottle of dressing into your bag. I guess you could, but you might look funny um, <laughs> with a bottle of salad dressing in your bag. So consider what needs to be prepped and what doesn't so that when you do have to grab and go, you're ready. For example, I like to buy baby carrots Um, in the small bags because they're easy to put into a container and I bought containers that had a separate cat a little it's kind of has a little caddy inside it for specifically for dressing and so um, I will prepare three or four of those with celery hearts or with baby carrots with the dressing already measured out and and in there and it just sits in the fridge and we can grab it on the way out Um, if you purchase those things on the go they're more expensive so if I were to be out and I wanted to buy a fruit cup I'm going to probably pay three to four dollars for a fruit cup on the go. And that's pretty expensive for a small amount of chopped up fruit. But if I wash the grapes when I brought them home and I put them in a colander and have them on a shelf, then I can very quickly grab a bunch, drop it into a container or a reusable baggie and um, put it into my bag. So really take inventory of those things that need preparation and go ahead and get those prepared and those that don't. Um, I like to also bring almonds and cheese, but cheese sticks and almonds in those pre-measured items, they're more expensive. So we really should get into the habit of using containers or small snack bags to take larger bags that perhaps we bought even at some of the warehouse stores and divvy them up into portions. So taking a, a block of cheese and cutting it into sticks and putting them in small baggies is actually much more Um, budget friendly than buying cheese sticks. And then also it does cut back on the waste if you, especially if you use reusable bags, Um, then all of those peel wrappers that come off of them. Same thing with, like I said, almonds, um, whole grain crackers, buying a whole box of whole grain crackers and putting them out in small baggies. Um, I like to use baskets to make it fun. So if you open up my pantry, you'll see some wicker baskets with all snacks that have been kind of pre-measured and prepared. It almost looks like a gift bag. You have oh, to think nice. of it that way, right? Like open up the pantry and find all these little mini gift bags of snacks that you can grab and take on the go. So that's one way to be prepared. It's also a way to um, save money. Uh, and I've even gotten teased before, you know, those little mini cucumbers you can buy like, oh, for, sure. Yeah. So they're like Persian to, or something, right? They're yes. Small. I like to buy those at Trader Joe's because they're very inexpensive for, for that at that particular store. We have one close to us. But um, I remember one time I reached in one of my purse and I pulled one out and started snacking on it. And, and a colleague, I, I'll never live that down about um, <laughs> having a cucumber in my purse. And so, <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a running joke, but it was delicious. It was there. I was ready and it was portable. It didn't need any cutting or preparing. So think about those types of snacks, snacks that you like. Those that need preparing, get that done again on Saturday or Sunday. Um, those that don't have them ready to grab and go, a bowl of apples, a bowl of cutie oranges, bananas, whatever it might be. Um, just don't forget they're in your bag because a banana that's been forgotten is never <laughs> a good thing. 
<laughs> oh, it'll remind you it's there, right? <laughs> it will. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Yeah. And and say a little bit more about your when when you do your planning and your pre-cooking of certain items. What does that look like, Carrie, in your home? Well, so one thing I like to do is again, I, I told you I hate to, to throw food away. So it's really good that every couple of days we check our fresh items. And if they're starting to go, we have two choices. We can either quick chop them up and eat them, or we can prepare them in a way that they can be used later for cooking. Let's take, for example, um, peppers. Um, I like to buy a large thing of peppers that have all the variety, red peppers, yellow peppers, green. And of course, you've heard the saying, maybe eat a rainbow. So there's a lot of nutrients in colorful foods. But oftentimes, they will get toward the middle or end of the week, and there might be a pepper that's getting a little, maybe a little wrinkly on the counter. And so um, it, we, we experience that with our fruits and tomatoes and vegetables and things. I suggest taking 10 minutes to quickly chop them up and put them into um, some sort of storage form and tossing them into the freezer. The next time I go to make fajitas, I've got chopped peppers ready to go, which is going to save me time. Mm. Um, so it's a good way to um, take an inventory through of our foods, decide whether or not you want them cooked and frozen or whether you'd like them raw, frozen. Um, sometimes it's helpful to blanch them. My mother taught me that, you know, one minute in boiling water and then um, toss it into the freezer. It's, it's just the right um, consistency and it'll help them be preserved. Um, so that's one way that um, I use uh, foods that uh, are starting to go bad. Another thing is eating seasonally. We can store foods for months that are in season. So uh, I go to the farmer's market often in the summertime. And one thing I do is, is I really stock up on tomatoes because I like to use tomatoes in sauces, in casseroles, um, even you know, making salsa homemade. So one thing I'll do is I'll stock up on tomatoes when they're really inexpensive and then I'll freeze tomatoes for the winter time. If you head to the grocery store too, you will always see a for sale sign on the vegetables for something. So this week it might be broccoli. Next week it might be asparagus. I can guarantee you there's going to be some vegetable on sale this week. And so it's almost like a fun game. What are we going to eat this week? Well, let's go see what's on sale. Mm -hmm. um, if it's eggplant, I guess we're going to figure out a fun way to um, try eggplant if we've never done that before. Or maybe I can ask friends for a recipe. Hey, I purchased some eggplant. Tell me how I could use this. With social media, you know, we get lots of ideas. So I would say also to purchase seasonally, uh, purchase what's on sale, uh, and then consider storing them for future use to even save you time in your meal prep down the road. Mm, yeah, uh, a quick eggplant reference. When we had a farm share and we were getting way more than we could use a lot of times or too much of one thing at a time, right? You give some away, but I used to hide eggplant in my meat sauces. I would chop it up small and saute it in with the meat and it would be kind of invisible, but it would be that just extra layer of added nutrition, you know, cooking up a fresh vegetable in there that in the marinara sauce or whatever it was, was really invisible. And we'd have kids over our house that had never had eggplant before. And I wouldn't tell them it was there until they'd eaten it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a really great tip. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, ways that we can work in more color and variety into our sauces. Like with spaghetti sauce, you could absolutely add squash to that for a variety. And again, um, like you said, it's not that it would be, it would be undetected in the flavor and maybe add an additional benefit to it, not only nutritionally, but maybe the texture, um, what, what it might be. But I do the same thing sometimes. We can also bake um, by adding things. Um, I put zucchini in my banana bread mm -hmm. um, and I don't think my kids would have eaten zucchini bread, but then when I said it was banana bread and it tastes like banana bread, they didn't seem to mind the little strings of green things in it. <laughs> you know, they're like, what is this? Well, it's banana bread with a little bit of zucchini. And that was okay. <laughs> Clever mom. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk, say some more about what we can do with, say, family favorites that maybe aren't that healthy. Well, um, there's a, a link to a resource that I've, I've provided. And basically, um, it's a website that you can go to and it gives you a variety of substitutions. There, um, it's, a, from, it's actually a website that was um, from Mayo Clinic 
and um, it gives you substitutions for many different reasons. So there might be things, let's take a couple examples of what constitutes healthier. Maybe there's a diabetic in the family and we need to reduce the sugar. Well, a great substitution for sugar, of course, are some of the natural choices, but also like fruit uh, puree. That's a great source of sweetener. Um, perhaps there's somebody in the family who needs to reduce cholesterol and saturated fat. Well, we could also substitute applesauce for oil in a recipe. Um, there might be somebody in the family or you maybe overall you wanna increase the amount of fiber. And so you wanna substitute half of your flour with wheat flour. Um, but there is a great website. And again, this is through the Mayo Clinic and it's Healthy Recipe Substitute and it's a guide to ingredient substitutions. So I would recommend bookmarking that and thinking about how you could use skim milk perhaps instead of whole, um, maybe um, whole grain rice instead of white rice. Uh, because real whole grains I recommend um, highly over any kind of refined grains at any time because we have we get our omegas and our B vitamins from whole grains. So when we have um, white rices and white flours and, and grains where we've stripped off the, the outer grain, um, we've taken out those the vitamins and the healthy fats that we need from that. So um, that's one of the resources that I use often is just kind of thinking, how could I substitute an ingredient here or there? Mm. I don't suggest multiple ingredient substitutions all at once. Um, that can be a recipe disaster. For example, <laughs> I don't suggest taking three cups of white flour and substituting three cups of wheat flour. Um, it will be a bit heavy. Um, and you don't want to take the recipe and completely change it. We're only looking for small substitutions and small changes do add up over long periods of time. Mm, that's so comforting to think that just those little changes that are not going to upset the apple cart and make everyone feel like uh, grandma's famous macaroni and cheese is never going to be the same again. And then they start to resent healthy eating. But if you're just, oh, yeah. yeah, weaving in those small changes. And they'll know. I mean, your kids will know. My daughter could knew when I switched out a brand of pasta. Wow. And uh, kids are pretty savvy and they're pretty smart about that. And then they might stop and say, this doesn't taste the same. So <laughs> I don't necessarily um, recommend, be, you know, not saying anything at all, but saying, hey, I just made a tiny little change to this. Let's see if we, you know, what do we think about it? And, and even talk about it because it's teaching them again, also healthy choices and substitutions. Mm, and, and I know that when we talked earlier, Dr. Behrens, you also talked about kind of involving your kids in creating hacks. Um, could you say a little bit about that? Because we are, you know, as you know, as a homeschooler yourself, we're big learners. We love to involve our kids in anything that's going to create some learning opportunities. How would sure. you make that fun? <laughs> well, there's a couple of things I really like to do. Um, let's take, for example, breakfast. You could do oatmeal as a staple and maybe perhaps put out little bowls out on the counter or on the island and have a variety of different things you could add in and talk about why they're healthy. Let's say for walnuts, walnuts are really good for brain health. Uh, you might have blueberries, which are antioxidants. You might have some flaxseed and maybe they've never seen flaxseed and don't even know what it is, but it's a really good source of omega fats, which is really good for brain health um, and for other things as well. So I would say put a variety of foods out and say, all right, get your bowl of oatmeal. We're gonna just add in what we want and make it your own. And it's a good opportunity to not only allow them some autonomy in their choices, but what kind of flavors they prefer, um, but it also teaches them as they go that we can add in and make uh, breakfast bowls, or we can do the same thing with yogurt with snacks, have multiple things you can put in the toppings. Uh, maybe you want to make your own granola and um, involve the kids in making that. And you can use that to put in oatmeal or toppings or even um, as a dessert um, when we choose to have ice cream, to put a little bit of that on top with some flaxseed in the granola. So that's one thing I like to do is breakfast bowls. Another thing is dinner bowls. Um, I always like to food prep three or four vegetables, three or four types of starches. So maybe the healthier choices like sweet potatoes or whole grain rice, and then maybe three or four different types of proteins, maybe a fish, maybe a poultry, uh, maybe a lean meats, or maybe a tofu, or maybe a non-meat um, alternative or substitution for protein. And then I allow the family to create their own bowls. 
So we like put the ingredients out and say, all right, who would like to add, maybe we'll do rice and beans and chicken and put some salsa on and we'll call it a Mexican night. Uh, maybe we'll have another night where we do a Mediterranean flavor or maybe some curry flavor and talk about the culture of Indian food. Um, and so we can take the same basics, the same carbs, the same vegetables, the same meats. And just by changing up the flavors and the seasoning, um, we can actually, uh, learn a bit more about cultural different types of foods and then add and introduce new flavors. But again, there's no choice. It's, it, as long as they take one from each category and put it in the bowl, you can guarantee they're getting a variety. Mm -hmm. And they're learning so much and they're practicing making choices. I'm sure we could do a whole episode on this, but say a, a word or two about looking at labels when we shop. Well, so mm. uh, I'll tell you <laughs> about a fun activity I do with my college level nutrition class. The first week I asked them to bring in a nutrition label that has a claim on it. And so they bring anything in from a Cheerios box that says, it, you know, it's good for your heart. Um, they bring in Cliff Bars, um, which are, um, I don't know if you're familiar with those. They're, yes, they're like yes. an energy bar label. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll even bring in like a Gatorade bottle. Um, Perhaps it's a package that said no GMOs on it. And that was the claim. So we, we break them down and we talk about these things. And unfortunately, many things that are on the labels that grab our attention, are they're there, of course, for so that we buy the foods. Um, let's take, for example, the things that say non-GMO. You know, we see that a lot. Well, first of all, we automatically think, well, then GMOs must be bad. And there's a lot of research. You know, I'm not going to go into that today, but... Um, we do, do we even know what that means when we're choosing non-GMO? And there are only um, specific foods that are even genetically modified organisms, that's what GMO stands for, that exist. And so when you put non-GMO on a food that it, it never was, it's not even a possible choice for a GMO, what they're trying to do is make it sound healthier. Um, I've seen gluten-free on foods that, of course, they're not, there wasn't any gluten in them, but it makes it sound healthier. If it's mm. non GMO and gluten free, another label is all natural. Well, Lay's potato chips are all natural. It's just salt and potatoes and, um, and oil, but is it a necessarily a healthy snack choice? Maybe not. So we have to <laughs> barely um, teach our children to be good connoisseurs of uh, food as far as the labels go. Um, Welch's fruit snacks and some of the cereals. Um, and, you know, and I'm not trying to call out any brands, but they will target mothers, you know, like this is, this is good for children to start the day with this particular food because research shows that it helps them in their schoolwork. Um, and so mm -hmm. you can take claims like that and claims are allowed because if they can be tied to research studies that show that yes, those children who do have a healthy breakfast do end up having, um, doing better in school. So they, they're going to maximize um, as much as possible, different words, different colors, even different claims, so that we can really teach our kids how to be um, kind of good detectives. You know, I, I love the book, The, the Fallacy Detective, um, you know, just in teaching them on how to analyze certain claims on nutrition labels. Mm, interesting. Yeah, we could just go on and on, couldn't we? Yeah. Um, what, what would you like to leave us with, Dr. Behrens? Oh boy, so much, right? <laughs> yes, it is a lot, but we're going to have your links in the show notes and, and people can enjoy this episode more than once. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I have a, just a couple of final thoughts. One of them is to keep it all into perspective and know that, you know, we're not going to, we're not heading for perfection here. We're looking for progress. We're looking for small, fun, easy ideas we can implement into the family. We're going to have days and weeks and even months, um, depending on our life circumstances, when we fail to plan. Um, and we toss food out that we didn't eat. And the, we do have to run through that drive through occasionally. So I would say, don't beat yourself up on those. Good nutrition is not made in a day. It's not even made in a week or a month. Um, good nutrition is a consistent um, habit over a lifetime. And so I would say, keep it in perspective, do the best you can, but don't beat yourself up when you have those times when um, you, it just didn't all come together. And I guess another thought I would have is we're, we're meant to enjoy our food. You know, God probably would not have given us our wonderful taste buds and sugar cane if we weren't meant to enjoy our foods. And so keeping in mind those four tenets of healthy eating, that balance, moderation, adequacy, and variety, that it can include those yummy foods and those treat foods as well. 
Um, and it's important for us to enjoy those in moderation, um, but just to keep it in the perspective that um, we're to be good stewards of our body, but we're also, I believe, um, meant to enjoy the, the gifts that God has given us as well. Mm, amen. Amen to that. Oh, it's, it's always a joy, Dr. Behrens, and I hope you'll come back again soon. Um, we'll oh, have, I'd love to. Yeah, and we'd love, just so happy to have you as part of our Homeschool Connections faculty, teaching nutrition and, and physical education, fitness, uh, American Sign Language, just so much. And those links and the link to our previous episode will all be in the show notes. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. It's always good to have you with us. That's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com, where you can get online courses for your grade school, middle school, and high school student. Learn from the experts and make your homeschooling easier. Be sure to leave a review and share this podcast with your friends. And we'll see you next time here on the Homeschooling Saints podcast.